but welcome everyone. Uh, we're we're still having people logging in, but I am going to try and be respectful of everyone's time and uh, get us uh, started here. Uh, my name is Dr. Paul Carson. I'm going to be moderating today's event. I'm a professor of practice in the North Dakota State University Department of Public Health, and I'm the medical director for the Center for Immunization Research and Education, also known as CIRI, which is hosting today's uh, webinar. Today, I have the very great honor to introduce Dr. Paul Offit, who will be presenting this webinar titled, Is Polio Coming Back? A question I really thought I would not ever have to contend with in my career. Uh, Dr. Offit is the director of the Vaccine Education Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as well as the Morris R. Hillman Professor of Vaccinology and a professor of pediatrics at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a recipient of many awards, including the J. Edmund Bradley Prize for Excellence in Pediatrics from the University of Maryland Medical School and the Young Investigator Award in Vaccine Development from the Infectious Disease Society of America and a Research Career Development Award from the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Offit has published more than 160 papers in medical and scientific journals in the areas of rotavirus-specific immune responses and on vaccine safety. He's also the co-inventor of the rotavirus vaccine, Rotatech. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Offit, and you can go ahead and load your slides. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carson. So uh, I wanna talk about something that um, we're not talking about these days because we're talking pretty much only about COVID. But um, this worries me in many ways more than anything that's going on recently, which is polio, and I'll explain why. First, um, we have this slide where I have to say that I have no, um, no financial uh, conflicts of interest. I am a Philadelphia Eagles season ticket holder, which renders me incapable of viewing that team logically or dispassionately, but that probably doesn't have much to do with this webinar. So um, in June of last year, a 27-year-old man visited an emergency department in New York following five days of low-grade fever, neck stiffness, back and abdominal pain, constipation, and lower extremity weakness. The patient was hospitalized for 16 days and discharged to a rehabilitation facility with flaccid weakness of his lower extremities. As part of the National Acute Flaccid Myelitis Surveillance Program, the case was reported to the New York State Department of Health and the CDC. Nasopharyngeal swabs and CSF were negative by reverse transcriptase PCR for enteroviruses and human parechoviruses, as well as for a panel of common respiratory viruses and encephalitis viruses. The, the RT-PCR and sequencing of a stool specimen by the New York State Department of Health did identify poliovirus type 2. Additional sequencing identified the virus as a circulating vaccine-derived type 2 strain, so-called CVD-PV2, that differed from the Sabin oral polio vaccine strain by 10 nucleotides in one of the viral proteins, suggesting the transmission of this virus had occurred for at least one year. The virus was later detected in wastewater samples. This story was reported locally in Rockland County, New York, as well as nationally. So what happened? In order to understand what happened, we're gonna go back to the beginning. So this slide just shows the pathogenesis of poliovirus, which is uh, ingested through the upper respiratory and upper GI tract, where it re reproduces itself and then is spread either to cervical lymph nodes in the upper tract or through mesenteric lymph nodes in the small intestine, where it then enters the blood stream. And from the blood, it then travels to the brain and spinal cord, where it replicates or reproduces itself primarily in anterior motor uh, uh, neuron cells, or, uh, motor neuron cells of the anterior horn, um, causing paralysis. In 1952 alone, there were 58,000 cases of paralytic polio that were reported in the United States. 65% of those cases occurred in children between five and nine years of age. 90% of children and 100% of adults living with, with, with someone with polio became infected. Arguably, no disease was more feared. Um, I think that the, the particular horror of, of this virus is that it caused uh, permanent paralysis uh, in, in, in tens of thousands of children, but rarely affected the brain. So these children were perfectly aware 
of what was going on. Similarly, the virus could affect muscles of respiration. This is a slide from California showing uh, a, a ward full of iron lungs. I was actually, I was born in 1951. In 1956, I was uh, hospitalized in a polio ward uh, for about six weeks. I didn't have polio. I had had a failed operation on my right foot, um, but that landed me in a polio ward. And I remember iron lungs and I remember uh, what was then called the Sister Kenny hot pack treatments to try and, uh, which is she was an Australian nurse who believed that hot packs on muscles that were affected of the legs or arm could restore um, the, uh, the mobility, but it was incredibly painful. So I remember those children screaming. I remember children in iron lungs. It was literally hell. And I think that, that uh, certainly my parents were more scared of this, this uh, virus than anything else that was going on out there. This is not a disease you want to relive. Okay, so the first person to step up to make a vaccine to prevent this was Jonas Salk. Um, this is just a slide of Jonas Salk in the, uh, in the early 1950s. And what he did was he took polio virus and grew it up in non-neural cells as, um, as an extension of the work that was done by John Enders and Tom Weller, Weller and uh, Fred Robbins at, in Boston, where they had been able to grow virus in non-neural cells. And so, for example, if you had a, a theoretical million infectious particles um, per uh, ml, and you treat it at, at a certain uh, uh, concentration of formaldehyde at a certain pH for a certain length of time, then you could get roughly a million fold reduction over three days. Uh, he then assumed that if you continued that, that you would get another million fold reduction over the next three days so that you would have one infectious particle per million doses and then for another three days, one infectious particle per trillion doses. This was his straight line theory of an activation. And he trusted this um, because like all vaccine researchers, you can see a picture, at least pretty much any of them who have children, those children will be one of the first that's vaccinated. So you can see that there's Jonas Salk on the right, on the left is his wife at the time, Donna, and there's his son who is pretty much an unwilling participant in this particular event. And so then there was the, there was the, the polio field trial. Um, which um, was conducted by the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, otherwise known as the March of Dimes. And what they did was they um, inoculated, I'm not sure if that's on the next slide. No, not next slide, next slide. Yeah, okay. So, so the, the, um, what happened was you, you either got the vaccine or you got a placebo. Um, you then, then uh, would receive a lollipop. You got a yellow polio pioneer pin. And um, it was arguably the largest clinical trial of a medical procedure, or, or uh, in this case, biological, ever performed. This is what children looked like, by the way, in the 1950s. Just, just for your information, usually what happened after you got a vaccine in the 1950s, you didn't sort of line up and smile. This was a sort of staged photograph, but the children were pretty much made to smile. Okay, the person who ran that trial was Thomas Francis. Um, actually, ironically, in, in whose lab Jonas Salk had trained, Thomas Francis was a, uh, also a virologist and immunologist. He, he did seminal work on the, the uh, influenza vaccine. And what he did to make an influenza vaccine back in the 40s was he took influenza virus, grew it up in eggs, purified it, and killed it with formaldehyde, which is where Jonas Salk got the idea to grow up polio virus and purify it and kill it with formaldehyde. So three doses of vaccine were given intramuscularly for this field trial of, uh, that was run by Thomas Francis to 420,000 children. 200,000 were injected with a saline placebo and 1.2 million children were observed uninoculated controls. The efficacy was 65% against type one, 100% against type two and 96% against type three. Later improvements of the vaccine resulted in protection against all three serotypes caused by the inactivated vaccine of greater than 99%. Um, the trial was done with essentially thimerosal, an ethyl mercury containing preservative that was in this vaccine. And that's what caused the lower uh, uh, effective response or efficacy response against type one. So that was, that was uh, never done again. Also, I just want to make the point that Jonas Salk didn't want to do this trial. He didn't. Uh, he, he could not conscience giving 200,000 children in the mid-1950s saline placebo, knowing that every year about 30,000 children were paralyzed with the uh, virus, and knowing that every year about 1,500 children were uh, 
killed by this virus. He just couldn't conscience it because he had, he had inoculated about 700 children in the Pittsburgh area. He would found the vaccine to be safe. He would found the vaccine to be highly immunogenic, and he just couldn't couldn't uh, handle doing a placebo controlled trial with this vaccine in the 1950s. So those 1.2 million children who were observed on inoculated controls were concession to Jonas Salk. And so in, in August, on August 12th of 1955, Thomas Francis, shown there on the left, stood up at the podium at Rackham Hall at the University of Michigan and announced that this vaccine was effective. So the, the three words that he used, uh, that Thomas Francis used, were safe, potent, and effective. And those three words were appeared on the headline of every newspaper in this country. You know, church bells rang out, synagogues held special prayer meetings, uh, the Voice of America announced this uh, a result to Europe, uh, department stores stopped while this announcement was made over the last week, and I remember my mother crying. This was a, a, a major moment. But how did we know that it was effective? We knew that it was effective because 16 children died in that study, all in the placebo group. We knew it was effective because 36 children were paralyzed in that study, 34 in the placebo, placebo group. These are the sort of gentle heroes that you leave behind during these kinds of trials. And I think uh, don't really get often the recognition that they deserve. There is always at some level a human price to be paid for medical knowledge. And that was the price that was paid for that. So Jonas Salk's vaccine was then introduced in 1955 in this country. And you could see that as more and more people got it, the, the, uh, the rate of a number of cases of paralysis dramatically declined up until the early 1960s. Um, the, the Salk vaccine was, um, was safe and effective. There was, however, one flaw with that vaccine, that while the vaccine induced high levels of virus-specific neutralizing antibodies in the serum, it didn't induce mucosal immune response. And this becomes clearer as we start to talk about that case of polio that was seen in, uh, in Rockland County. Therefore, although people were protected against paralysis caused by polio, they could still be infected with polio virus, and they could still transmit that virus in stools. Okay, so in other words, this is just sort of a summary of how Jonas Salk's vaccine worked. It didn't work at the level of the, the upper respiratory tract. It didn't work at the level of the small intestine. It, it really worked at the level of the bloodstream. So um, that was, was uh, where the neutraliz neutralization by antibodies of that virus took place, therefore not allowing the virus to, uh, to enter the brain and spinal cord. Okay, so now we go to the next vaccine in the early 1960s, Albert Sabin's vaccine. So there's Albert Sabin in one of those rare moments where he's actually talking to Jonas Salk. So what he did, what Sabin did, was he attenuated poliovirus, both types one, two, and three, by serial passage in monkey kidney cells and monkey testicular cells. He actually worked uh, in the Rockefeller Institute in the laboratory, did Albert Sabin of Max Tyler, who had uh, made the yellow fever vaccine in the same way, by taking yellow fever virus and attenuating it by growth in non human cells. So it, both were influenced by their mentors. Sabin's trivalent live attenuated viral vaccine was introduced in the United States in 1963 and replaced Salk's vaccine. Because Sabin's vaccine was shed in feces, about 25% of people in the home of someone given that vaccine would seroconvert, so-called contact immunity, as distinct from herd immunity. This, this is contact immunity. You're coming in contact with someone who's shedding a vaccine virus, you acquire that virus, and then you become immune. Unlike Jonas Salk's inactivated polio vaccines, Sabin's oral vaccine did induce intestinal immunity, which also is going to become relevant as we talk about this polio case in Rockland County. So again, uh, as is always true, you get that stock photo of people uh, taking the vaccine. This was a lot easier to take. I remember I got the, uh, the, the Salk vaccine in the late 1950s, which was a shot, and then I got the oral vaccine. So I got both those vaccines, which was dropped onto a sugar cube and then ingested. So that was a fun vaccine. It was just this little sort of, as from your, the, the mind of a, a nine or 10 year old, it was just a, a sugar cube that had a red dot on it. So this vaccine works differently. Here, unlike uh, Salk's vaccine, you have intestinal immunity. So you're sort of more of a front line of defense then against polio. And it was cheap. It was easier to administer because it wasn't a shot. So it didn't require paramedical personnel. And this is just sort of an ad at the time. Is your local health and your family's worth 25 cents? I know it's hard to believe anything ever costs 25 cents, but that's what that vaccine cost back then. 
And because of this vaccine, because of Albert Sabin's polio vaccine, polio was eliminated from the United States by 1979. This is just a, uh, an article in, uh, by Neil Nathanson in Reviews of Infectious Diseases about that event. And polio virus was eliminated from the Americas by 1994. In 1975, about 6,000 children in the Americas were paralyzed by polio every year. With technical support from the Pan-American Health Organization, vaccine coverage in children less than one rose from 25% in 1978 to 80% in 1993. By 1994, polio had been eliminated from the Americans. The last case was in a child born in the mountains of Hunin, Peru, whose name was Luis Fermin Tenorio Cortez. He was the last case of polio, wild type polio, natural polio, in the Western Hemisphere. And as we, we continued to uh, use this vaccine in the world, we began to eradicate polio from the world. In 1988, 350,000 cases of paralysis caused by wild type polio occurred in 125 countries. In response, the World Health Assembly established the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. Global Eradication of Polio Type 2 was certified on September 20th, 2015. Global eradication of polio type 3 was certified in October 24th, 2019, and in 2021, only six cases of wild type polio type 1 were reported in two countries, Pakistan and Afghanistan. But Sabin's vaccine had one critical flaw, and it is a flaw that we continue to pay for. The live attenuated strains of polio in Sabin's vaccine could revert to neurovirulent type, so-called circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus. It was rare. It occurred in one per 3.8 million vaccinees, but it was real. And vaccine-associated paralytic polio is an unfortunate confluence of three events. One, mutations introduced by serial passage in cell culture are not terribly stable. Polio virus is a single-stranded RNA virus that undergoes at least one base pair change per cycle of replication. I mean, basically all viruses mutate. Single-stranded RNA viruses are, are less faithful among those, the, the generally among viruses. And Sabin's vaccine is attenuated for growth in the central nervous system, but it's not attenuated for growth in the intestine. You can shed polio virus in your intestine for weeks, sometimes months, and that allows the virus then to, um, to undergo mutations, which could affect those sites that were associated with attenuation. So, although we eliminated polio from this country by the late 70s, we didn't eliminate polio caused by the vaccine. So every year, Joan, or Albert Sabin's polio vaccine would cause something called vaccine-associated paralytic polio. And so um, every year, eight to 10 children would suffer polio caused by the polio vaccine. At a time when we'd eliminated polio, wild type polio, we still were causing polio in eight to 10 children every year by this vaccine. So for that reason, in 1998, the United States switched from an all OPV vaccine schedule to two doses of IPV followed by two doses of OPV. I was actually um, on the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices in 1998 and was asked to be head of the polio working group. And that was my charge to try and move us away from, the, from Albert Sabin's oral polio vaccine back to Jonas Salk's inactivated polio vaccine. And in 2000, the United States switched to an all IPV schedule, thereby eliminating vaccine associated paralytic polio from our country. So now we could finally say that we were polio free because we weren't giving a vaccine that caused polio. And in 1960, I'm sorry, in 2016, the World Health Organization recommended that all countries using OPV should administer at least one dose of IPV prior to OPV to lessen the chance of vaccine-associated paralytic polio. So this is sort of a map of the world in 2015 before that recommendation, and you can see the, the sort of the darker blue represents those countries or areas not using OPV. But one year later, the countries that were not using OPV dramatically increased, either giving IPV followed by OPV or giving IPV alone. Um, since then, there have been 12 distinct uh, circulating vaccine-derived polio type 2 outbreaks and more than 50 uh, events that have occurred after global cessation, cessation, uh, cessation of the routine use of Sabin type 2 vaccine. 
These events have occurred in areas, not surprisingly, with low immunization rates. The response has been to immunize with a monovalent OPV type 2, which suffers the same problems that the, uh, the uh, vaccine uh, was associated with before, which can generate, can also still generate these, these revertin strains, as has been recently observed in parts of Africa. So that's not the solution. In 2020, there were 1,115 cases of vaccine-derived poliovirus because this virus circulates, uh, all caused basically by um, the CVD-PV2 primarily. In 2021, there were 698 cases that were reported. At the same time, only six cases of wild-type virus occurred in the world. So when you talk about polio in this world, what you're really talking about is you're talking about vaccine-derived type 2 polio not wild type polio anymore. It's just now we're dealing with the consequences of the choice that we made when we went to Albert Sabin's vaccine. Since September 2022, 292 cases of vaccine associated paralytic polio have been reported in Yemen, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Nigeria, Chad, Niger, Madagascar, Mozambique, Benin, Somalia, Ghana, Algeria, Eritrea, and Togo. So what happened in Rockland County? Um, this is just a, uh, a picture that is a figure that was taken from the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, looking at sort of where this man had traveled. But you can see that, that um, before he went, he'd started to develop symptoms that eventually, eventually became clear uh, that it was paralytic polio. He had attended a large gathering. And it's, it's, the thinking is, is that because there were people at that gathering who had been overseas, either in Europe or in Jerusalem. Um, they, the, the thinking was that that's where that virus had come from because he was infected with vaccine-derived polio type 2. That's what he was infected with. And so that's, that people were thinking this was coming from outside this country. And that's a critical question as we move forward. Um, because remember, um, of, of, you have to infect roughly 2,000 people with vaccine derived paralytic type two to have one case of paralysis. So when you see his one case of paralysis in Rockland County, you can assume he's sitting on the top of a much bigger iceberg. And so to answer that question, um, the CDC and local health departments looked at the, um, the wastewater in Rockland County and in the surrounding county, um, Orange County. And there they found that these vaccine-derived type 2 uh, paralytic virus was detected in 69 separate wastewater samples in Rockland County and neighboring Orange County. Um, on July 21st, 2022, the Rockland County Health Department issued a health alert encouraging those who were unprotected to be vaccinated. But what we're encouraging them to be vaccinated with is the inactivated vaccine. That's the only vaccine available in this country. It's the only vaccine that should be available in this country. Um, but remember, when you get the inactivated polio vaccine, you will, and then you're exposed to this vaccine-derived type 2 vi virus, you are, you are, have dramatically lessened your chance of getting polio. But you can still shed the virus because you don't have very good intestinal immunity following the inactivated vaccine. And so 5,000 uh, polio vaccines were administered in that county uh, very soon. And according to the New York State Immunization Information System, statewide immunization for three days, doses of polio, this gives you a sense of why Rockland County, but three, the uh, statewide immunization for three doses of polio vaccine among children less than two years of age was 79%. In Rockland County overall, the immunization rates were 60%. But in the zip code of this man who had gotten uh, this, this vaccine-derived uh, case, immunization rates were only 37%. So this is a little closer to Africa. So now, now you're seeing why there are outbreaks in Africa of this, uh, this circulating uh, vaccine-derived polio type 2 was because of low immunization rates. And that was also true in the zip code where this man lived in Rockland County. So why were immunization rates in, in this particular area in Rockland County so low? Since 2014, an anti-vaccine group called Parents Educating and Advocating for Children's Health, which has the acronym PEACH, has been circulating magazines and pamphlets in a predominantly Orthodox Jewish community, which is where this man lived. The pamphlets falsely claim that vaccines are in opposition to Jewish law, which is not true, and that vaccines cause autism, which also isn't true. 
The pamphlets recount anonymous horror stories of children who have suffered permanent harm from vaccines. So this is an example of that vaccine safety handbook and informed parents guide with that acronym PEACH. And this is just a, a picture taken from that book. And there's a lot of actually uh, Hebrew phrases that are uh, throughout this book. This is appealing to an Orthodox Jewish community in Rockland County, New York. Um, and this just shows um, the effect of that kind of um, targeting by anti-vaccine groups of this community. And that's often true. Often, it's often that they will target sequestered groups. So the polio case wasn't the first time that Rockland County residents had suffered a vaccine preventable disease, because remember I said that these pamphlets have been distributed really since 2014. And in 2018, there was a, a measles outbreak of 186 confirmed measles cases. This is still going on, by the way, in, uh, in ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities in New York, measles. And so, as a consequence, the, um, the uh, local and state health departments sort of launched a measles immunization effort, which you see some slides of here. Now, as I said earlier, anti-vaccine activists often target sequestered populations. Um, here's Robert F. Kennedy Jr. speaking to an Amish population in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, not far from where I live and very close to where my son lives. Um, and so he's there proffering bad information. It explains in part why immunization rates in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania are fairly low. Similarly, Andrew Wakefield, as well as other anti-vaccine activists, targeted a Somali-American community in Minnesota and caused their immunization rates to drop from 92% into the low 40% range. So how can we stop the spread of circulating vaccine-derived polio virus type 2? The best strategy you could argue would be to stop the spread using a vaccine that induces intestinal immunity but doesn't revert to neurovirulent type. The vaccine should be inexpensive and easy to administer. Now there's been a collaboration between scientists at the University of California, San Francisco, the National Institute for Biological Standards and Control in the UK, and the United States FDA and the CDC to create what is now called a novel OPV type two strain that is much, much, much less likely to revert unlike the current strain, which can revert, albeit rarely, but still uh, enough, and it's called NOPV. The preclinical trials of NOPV have shown that it is immunogenic and stable in experimental animals. Um, and this is just a, a slide uh, showing um, a paper that was published in Cell Host and Microbe about this particular virus which, that has been made, this, this uh, much more stable type 2 virus. It's shown here, it has at least five mutations that stabilize this virus and make it less likely to revert to neurovirulent type. But it is a live attenuated virus. And like all live attenuated viruses, it reproduces itself. And like all viruses that reproduce itself, it can mutate. I think, I think the chances that it will mutate back to neurovirulent type are extremely, extremely, extremely small, but it's not zero. So this is um, a paper that was published in Nature. The new polio vaccine is point this novel OPV that was poised to get landmark approval. And that's what happened. The World Health Organization approved NOPV on no November 13, 2020. Since March 2021, about 450 million doses of this novel OPV have been distributed in 21 countries to combat outbreaks of CVDPV2 in Nigeria, Liberia, Benin, Congo, Tajikistan, Sierra Leone, and Niger. 38 countries have now met the verification requirements for administration of NOPV. And this just shows those countries um, where NOPV has been launched. This is shown in blue. The green shows those who were verified for NOPV use, the orange for those with whom verification is in progress. But you can see you're targeting primarily um, Africa and to some extent uh, uh, Asia and Southeast Asia, because that's where these, um, the, the, for the most part, we've been identifying um, the, this revertant type 2 virus. So should any OPV be used to quell outbreaks of CVDPV2 in the United States? Should we do this here? Should that case have alerted us to what's going on here? 
So this was a, um, a paper that was published in the British Medical Journal um, about what we should do by Jay Varma and Nina Ashwabe. Here's what they said. In late July, the New York State Department of Health reported that a person had been paralyzed as a result of polio and infection likely to acquire to have been acquired in the United States. Subsequently, the same variant of polio virus was detected in sewage samples in several counties in New York, indicating that hundreds of thousands of people may have been recently infected. On September 13, 2022, the United States was added to a list compiled by the World Health Organization of countries with circulating polio virus. The reality on the ground has clearly changed since 2000. This is why New York needs to be prepared to introduce NOPV. So the concerns are here. First of all, we need to determine the extent of the problem by testing wastewater samples in all major US cities, San Francisco, Las Vegas, Philadelphia, etc. And the good news is the CDC is doing that. Um, I think we need to, to know the extent of this problem. We need to know the extent to which this revertant strain is circulating in our country. Now, we have a very high immunization rate with, uh, with IPV. And if you've gotten IPV, you are not going to get polio caused by this revertant strain. But as we see a, a continued erosion in vaccine rates, especially in that uh, community you saw in Rockland County, we're at risk in the same reason that countries in Africa are at risk. And I think we need to know this and hopefully we'll be able to get this information and hopefully this will wake up people to the fact that although they think polio virus is an ancient disease and has nothing to do with us, it does have something to do with us. Um, as I said earlier, NOPV is a replicating virus that will continue to mutate because all viruses mutate, although NOPV has not caused vaccine associated paralysis to date that possibility does remain. IPV will not stop the spread of uh, CVDPV2, but it will prevent paralysis caused by the virus. A highly vaccinated population with IPV does solve the problem. So we can solve the problem as long as we have a highly vaccinated population against IPV. And do we really want to reintroduce another live attenuated polio vaccine in this country? I guess my bias in this area is that I was head of the polio working group between 1998 and 2003 when I was on the ACIP. And I, we all worked very, very hard to get a live attenuated virus out of this country. Um, in fact, we brought uh, a person named John Salamone, whose son had suffered uh, paralysis caused by the oral polio vaccine on that committee so we could put a human face to this problem. And I think it was an accomplishment to get that vaccine out of this country. And I guess I'm a little hesitant about uh, bringing yet another live attenuated viral vaccine in this country when the problem can be solved with IPV, but it's not going to be solved if we choose not to get that vaccine. And I think one thing that these CD study, CD studies might show people is that if this, this revertant type two is circulating in, in, your communicating, in your community, know that you're at risk if you're not vaccinated. Okay, so this is just us, at children, this is our Vaccine Education Center website at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I also just wanted to show you this, um, uh, to scan this because you must complete this to acquire your continuing education credit. I'll leave that up there for a second so you can take a picture. And otherwise, um, thank you for your attention. See, I, I'm assuming you're paying attention. I mean, I'm sitting here in, in like a third floor of our house talking to myself. I assume that you guys are paying attention, but uh, I will take your questions. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Offit. I, I, I thought I knew a fair amount about uh, polio and the vaccines, and I just realized I learned quite a bit from this, um, as I'm sure most of our audience did. Uh, I'm going to, um, I've got several questions coming from different areas. One, one of the first questions, I think you you address, but I'm in case because I'm not familiar with all the details in this. You and you might be. I'll, I'll I'll put it out there. One of the questions was about the recent perspectives piece in the New England Journal of Medicine, choosing the right path towards polio eradication, which was uh, fairly recent. Um, wondered if you'd seen that and your opinion on that. And I think this gets to the um, newer oral polio vaccine as as the path. But did, do you have any comments on that uh, beyond? What you um, what you already gave us here on your opinions in the last few slides, right? So I, I did see that. Piece. I, I think the uh, the third author on that was Stanley Plotkin, who was my former mentor. I mean, I generally agree. I, I think that um, 
we we do need to define to what extent this virus is circulating in this country and then we're going to have a decision to make do we want to bring bring NOPV in this country I mean this is is um the advantage of Jonas Salk's vaccine is it works and it's safe the disadvantage of Albert Sabin's vaccine was was although it works and was cheap and provided contact immunity and was easy to administer it had a um, it had a dragon, and, and that dragon was that it it's, could cause paralysis, and we've been paying for that ever since. And so um, I certainly agree with the the, um, the notion that we have moved, need to move away from, from OPV, and hopefully um, we can avoid NOPV, but I think NOPV is certainly uh, um, important, I think, in areas that have low immunization rates, um, and, and maybe that's going to be us. And so I think if that's true, if that becomes us, then NOPV becomes important here. Um, and and I, I guess if you if since we were actually able to get through the last 35 minutes without ever mentioning COVID, but I, I'm, I'm now I'm going to break that and, and mention COVID. Um, I think the thing that worries me the most about about what's happened over the last couple of years regarding uh, COVID and sort of uh, sort of vaccine pushback is is in the last year alone there were 850 um, lawsuits against vaccine mandates, and it wasn't just COVID vaccine mandates; it was any school vaccine mandate. Um, and, and if you do polls of the American public and ask, do you think there should be school vaccine mandates, a one third of the, the public, the American public will say no. And if we do that, if we go back to sort of voluntary vaccination and don't have that catchment in school, you're going to see these, vac these diseases come back. I mean, and that's already happening. I mean, if you see, for example, in Columbus, Ohio, where there's an outbreak where 85 children, all less than two years of age, all of whom were unvaccinated, you know, get measles, uh, about 20 or so were hospitalized. Uh, that's what's going to happen. And um, the only reason we eliminated measles in this country was because we finally started to enforce school vaccine mandates uh, in the early and mid 1970s to the point that we eliminated the most contagious of the vaccine preventable diseases, measles from this country by the year 2000. It's come back because a critical percentage of parents have chosen not to vaccinate their children. That's what scares me the most, this sort of this kind of bodily autonomy, personal freedom, libertarian, government off my back, don't tell me what to do, I'll make decisions for myself notion. And I think that, that the problem with that is you're not making a decision for yourself. You're making decisions for those with whom you come in contact. And remember, there are millions of people in this country who can't be successfully vaccinated for a variety of reasons, because of their, uh, their comorbidities, because of the immunosuppressive medicines that we're taking. Do you have a responsibility to them? Uh, in a better world, we would think that we did. I uh, couldn't agree with you more. We have several bills working their way through our legislature right now that would, uh, if if in their original form, would have substantially impacted our ability to ensure uh, vaccinated school children. <clears throat> um, quite very concerning to to those working, to those of us working in this area. Uh, there's several questions that have come in, I, I think, sort of about individual risk here. Like in the United States, um, if if I'm living in an area where uh, the vaccine-derived polio is circulating as evidenced by wastewater, should I be considering getting a booster of IPV? Uh, you know, um, are there risks to me with, with just primary immunization as a child, or do I need to be thinking about doing more to prevent that? <clears throat> I think if you were vaccinated as a child, you continue to be protected. I, I, I think the, 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 at least the, the most, the, the good news, I, I think, I'll take a step back. I think, I think what, um, what was, when, when, when Jonas Salk made his vaccine and then Albert Sabin replaced it, the, the reason that people believe that Albert Sabin's vaccine was a better vaccine was that it provided quote unquote convalescent immunity meaning the kind of immunity that you get if you were naturally infected. I, I really hate the term naturally infected because nature, <laughs> there's nothing good, there's nothing good about this. And the word natural has good, good cachet, so that you were, that you were previously infected. Um, but, but that was wrong. I mean, I think Salk showed, and I think it was probably his, most, his, his best accomplishment, one for which he could arguably have won the Nobel Prize, which is you can take a virus, a whole virus, kill it, and induce a long-lived anamnestic response, memory response. That, to me, was his greatest accomplishment. Um, and, and so I think the answer is no. I think that if you were fully vaccinated as a child, I don't think you do need a booster dose. I think you have the kind of immunological memory that will protect you. Because remember, this is essentially, although it's, it's a short incubation period in terms of intestinal uh, replication, it's long incubation in terms of being able to cause paralysis. And, and for long incubation period diseases, all you need is memory. And so I think you have immunological memory that's long lived. Yeah. 
Um, my own question um, pertaining to the strategy you're, you're talking about, since it appears that only wild type uh, polio virus is circulating in Afghanistan and Pakistan, would it not be a reasonable approach that you use perhaps the, the novel oral polio vaccine just in those countries pretty much alone um, and, and using the IPV strategy everywhere else in the world? Right. So, so the cases of wild type virus are there, Afghanistan, Pakistan. But, but remember, that's that's not pol polio these days. Is that right. polio. that's polio? So I think right. that's where you have to introduce the NOPV is where you're seeing that kind, where that that uh, that because it's indistinguishable. It's clinically in the, the vaccine, the paralysis, or the the polio that is caused by these vaccine derived strains are cl the cl clinically indistinguishable from wild type. Consider it polio. Um, the difference is probably about one of every 200 people who is infected with wild type virus will be paralyzed. Well, it's more like one every 2000 with this vaccine derived strain. But the, the poly, once you're paralyzed, you're, you're paralyzed. I mean, it's not, there's no difference clinically. So I think anywhere where there's this virus is causing uh, um, polio should be a target for NOPV. And this country may be one of those countries. That may happen. We'll see, I keep waiting for that second case of polio to occur. Um. Question from one of our uh, regional health system leaders who's, you know, stepped up to the mantle several times on sort of our vaccine wars at the legislature asks, you know, given the, the disregard for the data and science that's sort of metastasizing out from anti-vaccination groups to the general population and into our legislative bodies, what are your thoughts on how we uh, combat this erosion of vaccination rates? Do you, I mean, are there are there strategies here where we can kind of push back on this or do we just have to wait for outbreaks to scare people again? Right. Um, well, actually, I don't know if you saw, but uh, just in the last few days, there was a bill introduced in Idaho by two uh, Republican legislators to essentially ban mRNA vaccines in their state. And that we had the same here. We had the same in our state, criminalizing it if we give it. It, it did not pass, thankfully, but it was it was uh, put out there. That's good to hear. It's in this race to the bottom. That's good to hear. Um, yeah, I, I think um, no. It's that's the that's the question of the day. I I, I think. That, that those who choose not to get back, well, uh, those who choose not to get vaccinated fall into two groups. The, 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 the more uncommon group, I think, is, is the conspiracy theorist. I mean, the person who believes that the pharmaceutical companies and the government and Bill Gates and others are out to, to destroy their lives, and they're just smarter than that, and they're not going to get a vaccine. But that's not most people. I, I really do think 85% of those who are choosing not to get a vaccine just aren't, um, just uh, are convincible. And I guess the, the, the evidence that I have for that is somebody like Ayla Stanford. So Ayla Stanford is an, an African-American uh, surgeon who works at Temple University, who took it upon herself to form the Black Doctors COVID Coalition. And she, you know, she went out to Philadelphia and ultimately vaccinated uh, 50,000 people because she sat in their homes. And these were people who weren't used to talking to doctors. They didn't have doctors. I mean, and this is one of the problems not having a, at least a, a, a workable national health system. And I think, you know, that's what is lacking. I think it's much easier to distrust the health system when you have no interaction with it. So what she did was, you know, she sat in their in their in their living rooms and she would go back again and again until they finally, you know, were, were willing to see it her way. And that's what we need. And, and I think that this kind of thing isn't going to happen at the at the federal level. I don't think it's going to happen at the state level. I think it has to happen at the local level. I mean, so, for example, when Andrew Wakefield and other people like Mark Blaxel, other anti-vaccine activists went into that Somali, Somali American community in Minnesota, you guys probably know this story better than me. You're closer there. But, he, um, you know, it, it's they went to the imams, you know, the religious leaders and tried to get them. So I think it's about sort of influencing people locally with people who they know and people who look like them. And I think that uh, people who they trust. And I think, you know, in, in the ultra Orthodox Jewish communities, it's a matter of trying to get rabbis and other sort of influential people in those communities who who also are ultra Orthodox Jewish to, to do that. Um, so I think I think that's the answer. It's local and it's not easy, but I think it's probably the best answer. Great, thank you. Um, one of the questions that came from one of our project managers who does a lot in sort of, sort of social media for our center, and I'm guessing this is some something she's seen on social media, is a question about the claim that Guillain-Barre syndrome is the new polio. And I'm not, I'm guessing what's behind that is that maybe people thinking that Guillain-Barre is really unrecognized polio, perhaps, or the polio vaccine isn't working. That's what I'm guessing is behind that. Or 
that vac I'm not sure what's behind it, or that maybe vaccines are causing Guillain-Barre syndrome to the, you know, to the tune of what used to be, you know, polio and, and that we're inducing problems. I'm not sure exactly. What, I don't know if you've heard this trope or question before, but um, do you, do you, no, I think you, you nailed it. I think it's this notion that vaccines are causing Guillain-Barre syndrome. And so we are causing polio instead of preventing it. Actually, it was born of uh, I mean, the FDR. I mean, FDR was probably the most recognized polio victim, but there were, even then, I mean, there were sort of questions about, you know, was it really polio? Or was it Guillain-Barre syndrome? It was polio, but um, you know, it's, we're really good at creating conspiracies, much better than we used to be, <laughs> sadly. Maybe you can comment on that, that, that there are marked differences between Guillain-Barre and polio. Uh, I mean, if you want to maybe briefly address that. And right. It's more of an ascending. the confusion. People, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So it's more of an ascending paralysis then. Right. So we, we can distinguish these very well clinically. Um, <clears throat> point on that. Um, let's see. A question here. A uh, question from one of our uh, public health folks on the Lancet study talking about natural immunity protection against uh, reinfection. I, I'm guessing that's about COVID. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So, so, I mean, so can natural infection protect against, um, for COVID we're talking about, right? For, can natural infection protect against severe disease associated with COVID? Yes. I mean, there's a number of studies that have shown that. I think that the, the, the other question is, um, can you in, uh, enhance either the longevity of that protection or the breadth of that protection with vaccination? And the answer is also yes. So I think, I think if you look, there's a paper by Chen and coworkers out that was published in Science Immunology out of Harvard that I think probably looks at this in the best way because we're about two years into this vaccine. So we know about two years worth of data. But um, I think that you're probably, assuming you're a healthy young person, you probably are best protected with either three doses of an mRNA-containing vaccine with, that, with, with at least two of the doses separated by four months, or two doses of vaccine plus a natural infection. And I, I, I've, I'm really trying to get away from using the term natural infection because a, a previous infection. Infection-induced immunity, <laughs> because yeah. I mean, it's, it's like the word "natural" has such cachet. And Mother Nature has been trying to kill us ever since we crawled out of ocean into land. So I don't know who her public relations team is, but I think we should all hire them because uh, she's not on our side. <laughs> um, if I can follow up on that a question, I have in my own mind. So <clears throat> I, I think if you look at some of the uh, zero survey data, um, particularly in younger people, we're probably ninety plus percent of us have had at least one COVID infection. <clears throat> and, um, uh, and, and, and you had have commented um, you know, publicly about how the, the bivalent booster doesn't seem to boost any differently than the uh, old booster. <clears throat> um, uh, yet, even with all, all of these infections, uh, you know, I look at my own parents in assisted living, they've had it uh, twice, uh, you know, did very, very well, you know, had all, multiple vaccines, but the, the observational data coming in from multiple countries, is, and I appreciate the limitations of the observational data, is that people who take the boosters, particularly at higher risks, seem to have less hospitalization, less mortality. Um, uh, who do you think warrants boosting? <clears throat> um, and, and now our only choice is the bivalent, right? So, um, and, and we still have, uh, I think it's about 54% of people over the age of 65 in our state that have not had uh, the, the current booster. All right, so there's a few few questions there. So I think, first of all, you probably have about 96% population immunity at this point from either previous infection or vaccination or both. It, we're at a very different stage of this pandemic. You can argue that if you define pandemic as, as a virus that changes the way you live, work, or play, that for the most part, we've left that. I mean, you see, you know, people gather in large groups and watch Super Bowl and watch the Eagles lose in the Super Bowl. So, so you know, you, you, you see that. Um, I think in terms of boosting, the, the, uh, I do think there are those who benefit from boosting. And, and if you look at, at both the CDC data and the data that's come out out of the UK recently, it really falls into four groups. One is people who are elderly, and it's especially really elderly, meaning if, if you, the UK study was over 80, the study in this country really was over 70. So, so I think older, older people, um, that, that clearly will benefit from the boost. But remember, th there are some who aren't gonna respond very well to a vaccine because of immune senescence. So for those people especially, and for all the groups I'm about to talk about, you should get, if you're, if you're infected, you should take an antiviral 
early in infection. So the second are people who have comorbidities, you know, chronic lung, chronic heart, chronic uh, kidney disease, uh, who are medically frail, for, for where even a mild infection could land you in the hospital. I think a booster is a value. These are the CDC data and UK data. Um, third are people who are immune compromised, and fourth are, are pregnant, people who are pregnant. Um, so I think those groups true, but I just don't see, I, I don't, I understand that the current public health recommendation is to vaccinate everybody over six months of age, but I don't see, given the data that we have, why a healthy 16 year old needs to get a, another boost. I don't, I, I don't, that's not who's getting hospitalized. And so where the CDC can really help us out here is really in a granular way, tell us exactly who is getting hospitalized and who is going to the ICU, because, because there are certain groups that are worth targeting. In terms of monovalent versus bivalent, obviously we don't have the monovalent, not only as a boost, but even as a prime anymore. Um, my, um, my thinking on this, and I wrote a New England Journal of Medicine uh, perspective piece on this um, about sort of how I think the bivalent story has been a cautionary tale. Um, I think we need to get away from Wuhan one. I, I, you know, the, the ancestral strain, I don't think needs to be in this vaccine anymore. The virus is gone. I think it's unlikely to co come back. I think the only place where Wuhan one is currently circulating is in white-tailed deer. Um, so, 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 I mean, maybe we can immunize them with this vaccine, but I, I think we need to get away from Wuhan one. And, and because it makes the imprinting hill much harder to climb. I mean, there are, so for example, if you look at, at when we um, had a bivalent vaccine with BA1, um, the original Omicron. Uh, the, there was a study done contemporaneously where, where and this is Moderna did this study, where you either got the bivalent vaccine uh, that contained Wuhan and BA1 or just uh, the monovalent vaccine. And clinically, there was no difference between those two. Similarly, uh, recently, just in the past few weeks, um, it was right, right, right but sort of at the, towards the end of January, there was a study done in uh, the UK where they still have both the monovalent as a boost and the bivalent as a, as a boost, and there's no difference clinically between getting one or the other. Now, that doesn't mean that the bivalent vaccine is not a value. It is a value, but, it, but I really am... Um, always a little saddened, I think, when the administration keeps pushing that it's so much better. I mean, the, 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 while the neutralizing antibody response is higher, that has not been a clinically relevant difference, as has been, which is what you care about. So I don't, um, I guess I wish we wouldn't uh, push that the way that we push it. Um, but in any case, uh, but boosters boost, and I think we should boost those who are, who are most likely to benefit. We'll see. I mean, I, our committee is going to be meeting both, at, at least we have dates set aside both May and June to talk about this. And I, I feel like we're sort of moving into this, this flu model, you know, where everybody over six months of age get, gets a booster. And I don't quite see that yet. And I think the CDC can help us with this. And um, I, I personally, I, I would like to get away from Wuhan one. And I think because T cells are so critical in protection against severe disease, I'd like to see more attention paid there. So there's preclinical studies with, you know, mRNA with SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and, uh, and a, a bivalent vaccine, if you will, with the nuclear protein, which is the largest of the protein, is a major T cell recognition site and, and you know, probably broadens um, your, your T cell recognition. Um, so that sort of thing, because I feel like we're, I just think, think all these moves have, to me, been lateral moves, you know, moving to the bivalent vaccine, either as a booster or monovalent vaccine. It hasn't been any worse. I just think it hasn't made anything better. Good. A uh, couple more. We got maybe another couple minutes here. Um, question about does the Rotatech uh, uh, vaccine hold the same concerns as the oral polio virus vaccine? And if so, have we seen uh, the same circulating concerns? This this is actually something I know something about. Um, yes, <laughs> rotavirus, right? Um, so uh, rotavirus is a double-stranded, segmented RNA virus. Um, and while it is true that all viruses mutate, this virus, at least to date, doesn't really create variants. So it's not it's 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 stable in in that sense. I mean, it's it's interesting, isn't? It? I mean, you have like. Um, measles is a, like, so SARS-CoV-2 is a single-stranded RNA virus, clearly mutates. Um, measles is a single-stranded RNA virus. We've had a vaccine for measles since 1963. I mean, we've had 60 years of a measles vaccine, and that virus hasn't mutated away. Um, mumps has to some extent. Um, with, with uh, there's sort of different circulating genotypes. You're protected as a child, but it appears that, you know, you're not as protected against an adolescent. So you could argue for an adolescent boost with, with that. The rubella vaccine uh, has been around since the late 60s, still, you know, not a problem. Um, so, you know, some viruses are different. I think people were surprised when SARS-CoV-2, um, when Omicron hit, 
because Omicron was an immune evasive strain. Even if you've been vaccinated or previously infected, you could still get a mild disease. It, it had drifted that much. It is a drifted virus. And I don't think people expected that. But now when people look closer at the four strains of circulating uh, human coronavirus, you can see that those strains drifted too. So um, I think we're learning about this virus. So in terms of rotavirus, not yet. That hasn't happened. It's a stable virus. But it, rotavirus is also sort of a uh, an education in that the goal of that vaccine, and it's probably 90 to 95% uptake in, um, you know, for rotavirus vaccines in, in among babies, um, the goal of that vaccine was the goal of this vaccine, which is, you know, keep keep, keep babies from coming going to the hospital, and there'd be 75,000 hospitalizations a year. Most pediatric residents haven't seen a case of dehydration caused by rotavirus, so that works. But rotavirus clearly still circulates in the community, still causes mild disease in the community. So. Uh, because you're, you're even if the entire world were vaccinated, even if the entire world were vaccinated with SARS-CoV-2 vaccine and the virus never created variants, which is similar to rotavirus, the virus would still circulate and still cause mild disease in some and severe disease in, in others because it is a short incubation period disease. And when you have a short incubation period, one, and neutralizing antibodies will fade over six months, which both of those things are true, then then you're, you, you, you know, Protection against mild disease really is mediated by the presence of high titers of neutralizing antibodies at the time of exposure. Neutralizing antibodies fade, mucosal, uh, this, this is a short uh, incubation period of mucosal infection. So you're always going to have mild disease. I mean, that's what you saw. When, when, when the vaccine came out in 2020, uh, end of 2020, December 2020, protection against mild disease in those two studies, Moderna and Pfizer, was 95%. Um, six months later, it was 50%. So why was it 95%? Those were three month studies. Those patients had, or participants had just gotten their second dose. That couldn't last. And if we could go back in time, I would like to go back in time after our vaccine advisory committee meetings and say, protection against mild disease is not going to last. Um, you know, but you can't go back in time unless you mix DayQuil with NyQuil. A lot of people don't know that, but that's possible. Okay. Uh, the question has come up on the current OPV vaccine uh, being given in other countries. To, can that count towards valid polio doses in the U.S.? I'm guessing this is for people who are, you know, immigrating into the U.S. Or um, yes, okay. yeah, sure. It's, a, it's it's an excellent vaccine. It just has a um, a uh, trap door in the back. Uh, you you touched on this question in your talk, uh, and you can maybe just reiterate for this person. Can you please talk briefly about the switch from trivalent OPV to bivalent OPV in polio vaccination campaigns and why that was done? Right. Well, as we started to eliminate, you know, type uh, two, type three, we started to walk back then on the these vaccines. Gone from the well, world. It's interesting, you know, the the. Uh, Valent is a Latin suffix, and so it demands a Latin prefix. So mono is Latin, bi is Latin, tri is actually Greek. So technically it should be tervalent, which actually is a word, and we'll never say that, but it does mix the Greek with the Latin, mm -hmm. which only angers, you know, the grammar gods. <laughs> right. IPV is recommended for travelers to countries with circulating wild-type poliovirus or a vaccine-derived poliovirus, would that not be an argument for extra IPV doses for those living in areas of the U.S. with polioviruses in the wastewater or cases in the community? No, that's a good question. I don't, um, there's, there's a, um, there's a um, podcast called TWIV, This Week in Virology, and the person who runs it is Vince Racaniello, who's a uh, virologist out of uh, New York at Columbia, and he's a polio expert. So this question gets bandied about all the time. Do you still have enough immunological memory if you've been vaccinated as a child? And I, I, I agree with him. I think you still do. But, but so I think this is sort of a cautious recommendation that's not necessarily based on data, and I think um, it's reasonable. Um, but if you ask me the question, just as a sort of virologist, immunologist, do I think you're still protected as a child? Yes, I think you're still protected. Dr. Offit, this is really excellent. We've had uh, tons of comments in here and people appreciating uh, this talk and the content you've given us. Um, we really appreciate your time. If you bump into your colleague and uh, Dr. Hotez, you can tell him you beat him on our participants by well over 100 more than he pulled in. I'm he definitely going to tell him that. Thank yeah, you. right. <laughs> uh, yeah, we had over 400 and almost 450 people uh, watching on online with us today. Thank you again very much for your time. Thank you, everybody, for participating. And uh, hopefully we can have you back again sometime in the future. That would be great. Take care. All right.
Bye, everybody.